I'm a member of a research team called VPNet, or Vulnerable Persons. Um, this is a new emerging team that was funded by the Canadian Institutes of, of Health Research. And we were funded to look at issues of vulnerability and end-of-life care. Um, over the course of the last five years, we've been exploring various different issues around vulnerability, having disabilities, and how those things can uh, inform or shape end-of-life experience. We came to the realization, however, that uh, those are issues that aren't normally included in curricula for palliative care trainees. And we thought it was really important to uh, take a moment um, at the end of this grant to really try and encapsulate, to summarize um, what we've learned, um, what we've learned so that we can make it available to palliative care trainees um, out there across Canada. We have looked at four big ideas, and I'm going to talk about the first idea, the big idea, which was rethinking vulnerability. When we began this grant, we applied as a team called Vulnerable Persons and End-of-Life Care. We did that because in the health research field, vulnerable persons was something health researchers and health research funders seem to understand. but. We really wanted to ensure that the community of people with disabilities were part of our team. And they told us, in no uncertain terms, we are not vulnerable. Don't name us as vulnerable people. So right from the beginning, we were taught that vulnerability does not equal disability. So we've been challenged to learn to rethink vulnerability. Some of the common assumptions that I think are made about vulnerability and who is vulnerable are that those who have so-called diminished competence and or decision-making capacity are deemed vulnerable. Children are seen as vulnerable. People who live in institutional settings are seen as vulnerable. Um, some people are defined as vulnerable under provincial legislation, including in Manitoba. And it's widely believed including by some health researchers, that disability absolutely makes you vulnerable. Vulnerability, again, can be used as a reason for protecting a person to the extent of taking them out of life, where they might suffer the anxiety of vulnerability, the apprehension of violence or misuse or abuse or neglect. On the other hand, it seems obvious that we're all vulnerable according to the circumstances we're in. Walking down a dark street in a certain area of town wouldn't matter if you were disabled or not. You might be very vulnerable. Certainly people who are ill or who are near end of life feel very vulnerable. We, every person on this earth, by virtue of being a human being, is vulnerable. Period. And that vulnerability, that sense of being a risk, that sense of, of you know, the possibility of unpredictable things happening um, is constant and it's universal. It, it, it affects everyone. But what we've also learned is that people can be made to feel more at risk or more vulnerable by the circumstances in which they live and the assumptions that others hold about them. So people can be made vulnerable or increased vulnerability by the law, by differences or perceived differences, differences in the way we walk, differences in the way we talk, differences in the way we speak or hear. Those all can make people feel more vulnerable. Other things that can make people feel um, uh, more vulnerable is um, not enough food or income, um, not enough supports, uh, either physical or emotional supports to live life well, limited education or access to um, building capacity or skills, including advocacy skills or income or wealth, can make people feel more vulnerable. Often, when people are made vulnerable, when vulnerability has increased, um, it's because they've been marginalized. When they're outside or they're seen as different, they're, they're, they're 
they're excluded, their needs and their experiences are not included when we develop things, including healthcare systems or palliative care systems. Early on in the, the course of, uh, of this uh, study, um, we looked at a traditional model of palliative care. And a traditional model of palliative care usually sees an interface between, or a relationship between palliative effort and curative effort. And as one becomes less plausible, as cure becomes less of a possibility, the, the hope and the overarching outlook would be that palliative care would become more prominent. Um, what we realize that in some ways that's a very two-dimensional approach. And VPNet, in my mind, really added a third dimension. And that third dimension has to do with this whole notion of marginalization, the idea that vulnerability can be socially constructed. We developed what we call the vulnerability model of palliative care, but it's more broadly a vulnerability model of um, health care and of access to services. And, and the picture is that um, when you are marginalized or excluded or made to be an other, somebody who is outside, um, your level of access to services decreases um, the greater your exclusion is. And often um, your options for palliative care um, may be very limited because you don't, your needs weren't included in the creation or the imagining of what palliative care looks like. Um, they may also mean that some people may assume um, they shouldn't try and keep you alive. Um, so your treatment options for health and well-being may be limited as well. And we've learned over the last years that vulnerability means risk and uncertainty for each and every one of us. And that what we need to do is create health care and palliative care systems that understand that risk and uncertainty affects each and every one of us. And learn from the experiences of people who haven't been included in the design and the um, development of palliative care and health care systems. Because their experiences of exclusion can teach us um, how to make better palliative care for every person. And that's one of our goals, to have inclusive palliative care. So um, how do we do this? How do we address this vulnerability? Then our response is to develop policies and programs and care practices that help to increase the assets, the things that we all have. So increase our supports, increase our uh, access to income if we're at end of life care, increase our dignity, our respect, our own integrity, um, and lessen the effects of, of, of the lack of resources. Palliative care was created historically um, by addressing the needs of people with cancer. And that's a really important population and it's, it's something um, very valuable. But not everybody who is at end of life has the same path um, in end of life as people with cancer. There's often a pretty predictable path with cancer. Um, there are lots of people who face uh, end of life as a result of chronic uh, conditions. That may be uh, diabetes, um, renal failure, it may be um, heart, uh, uh, heart problems, it may be uh, COPD, but it may also be deteriorating conditions, neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis or ALS. Those trajectories, end of life trajectories, are often really unpredictable. And people may be in care, they may be receiving supports um, to live um, much earlier uh, and be um, involved with the healthcare system much earlier than most people are. And so it may be difficult to figure out exactly when does end of life begin at that, that point of time. They may also have episodes of um, coming close to death and moving away from death and coming close to death. And so how part of the question that is raised when we, when we talk with people like that is, so how do we provide palliative care when we don't know when you're at end of life? And so the policy question is, what 
um, needs to change in our definition of eligibility for palliative care. Um, if we understand that some people go through episodes, some people are in care long beforehand, how does that change um, who's eligible to receive palliative care? The other thing that uh, disability presents when near end of life is the circumstances that disabled people are in. Chronic poverty and unemployment can lead to a lack of income and supports during the palliative care time. For example, may not have access to CPP or EI supports, which can make that more difficult. The fact is, as a disabled person, we very quickly learn that we are somewhat dis devalued in society. Our lives are thought of as less happy, less good, less worthwhile. So there may be decisions made that our life is not as important to us in terms of extending it. And end of life decisions may be made based on assumptions that are really not true. Now another area is that uh, we as disabled people, as marginalized people thought to be dependent, are often not seen as care providers. But like myself, when my mother now is approaching perhaps the end of her life, I am a caregiver, caregiver, care provider, and there are problems being accepted in the social environment as a care provider. Some of these are physical or financial, Others are really uh, simply attitudinal. Um, I know that there are other people with disabilities in this room who are currently care providers to family members at end of life. Now, a transition to palliative care often implies a move to an institutional setting. This can provide a great deal of discontinuity for people with disabilities, for example, who are already part of a care system. They may have personal care attendants. They may have special technology. These attendants may be particularly trained to their needs. And you can't just put another person in there and expect the same quality of care. One of the biggest challenges for people with disabilities that they told us throughout the study was that um, there's a huge loss that happens if they have to move into an institutional setting at end of life. Lots of people with disabilities receive personal supports, personal care through home care attendants, through friends, through a variety of other ways. They, they get bathing, they, get, um, they may get food, they, they may get um, other personal care through um, established networks of care. They've been managing their own care in many cases for most of their lives, or at least for um, many, many years, and they're, they're skilled at managing their own care. If they have to move into an institutional setting, several disruptions happen, and that means that they face a, a, a lack of continuity in care. The first is that um, their attendants, people who provided support in the community, community setting are not allowed um, to give that support in a hospital setting and won't receive pay necessarily to provide that. So often they have to train new um, nurses, uh, personal care attendants in a hospital or hospice setting who have very little experience in providing care to people with disabilities. So it's a disruption of losing familiar care providers, but also having to train new people at a point in time when they're very um, vulnerable. And um, those care attendants may not have the experience necessary to address um, or uh, to understand the level of skill that the people with disabilities already have in managing care and may not be used to patients who take an active role in their own care. Well, we often have a new doctor that doctor doesn't necessarily have all the history and experience. We have new personal care providers who may not know how we need to be lifted or, or bathed or uh, cared for or communicated with, whether we're deaf or whatever our circumstances are. We may not have access to the same technologies. 
that we had at home. Their use of maintenance be, may be quite foreign to the people in the institution that are caring for us. And if we've been using alternative medicine, whether it's some form of massage or some form of uh, herbal intake or even vitamins. For example, my mom, when she moved to the hospital a week ago, left all her vitamins back home. Uh, they were not part of the pharmaceutical regime and couldn't be administered by the caretakers where she moved to. And that can be a problem. It can be very stressful. Policy is in part, how do we make, how do we put palliative care um, programs in place to address the widest po possible populations? And part of when we look at policy is to say, um, here's how palliative care is working now. Here are how specific programs in specific places are working now. When we look backwards, we can say, oh, darn, there are a whole bunch of people who haven't been able to use palliative care. Why? Why does that happen? And so what we begin to understand is that our programs um, are made to help certain people, but may um, inadvertently exclude whole populations of people. And in that exclusion, um, we identify barriers. And those barriers may be things like, or the assumption, the policy assumption may be that palliative care um, related at, cannot happen in community-based settings when um, people require ventilators or when they use home care. Those may be situations where we assume people have to move into institutions. Um, those may be faulty assumptions. That may not have to happen. So part of what we can do in policy analysis is to say, well, is that really an accurate assumption? Is there any way we can bring community-based home care to people who use ventilators? Is there a way we can work with folks who um, don't have stable homes, who, may, work, who live, may live in transitional housing settings or who may be homeless, people who live with um, high levels of mental illness? What way can we reach those populations who've often been excluded from um, palliative care programs? When there's not very much consideration for coordination between disability-related policies and palliative and end-of-life policies and the programs that are associated with these two different universes, then people with disabilities encounter heightened or intensified vulnerability and stress. On the other hand, when these interactions are used as a basis to create more inclusive end-of-life policies, the result is better end-of-life care for all people, including those with disabilities. Finally, what is inclusive palliative care? Well, it means physical access, ramps, elevators where necessary, or buildings all on one level. It also means information and community, communication access, including written communication in multiple formats, including Braille, oral, communications with access to sign interpretation where needed. It means coordination between long-standing formal care providers, that is, those that provided care for us before we entered the institution, and the new care providers. Sometimes it means providing palliative care in a different kind of home. If we live in a group home, if we live in some other kind of setting that supports our lives the way they are, palliative care may have to move into those alternative kind of homes. Most importantly, it probably means inclusive attitudes and behaviors by palliative care workers that acknowledge the personhood of the individual, the dignity of the person. The first issue because ethics often comes down to legal documents. The kind of decision frameworks that people are asked to use to give themselves power at the time of their death are very challenging and often came up as a, as a debated area between the disability community 
And so one area that we looked at in the ethics theme had to do with things like advanced directives and proxy decision documents. And as we talked to people with disability and their families, often the, the dilemma was not being able to explain the life course of their disability and the fact that they had lived outside of that emergency room for 40 years in different kinds of ways. And that very specific advanced directives, which were favored by many medical ethicists, didn't anticipate the real situations that people experience during their, their living and dying at the ends of their lives. There are various sorts of advanced directives, but most of them have been set up um, or proposed by provincial authorities. Some of them have de been developed um, as legal or quasi-legal documents by groups with special f areas of impairment. So about 10 years ago, there was an attempt to make one for people with renal failure, people living with AIDS. They found that those um, which were like uh, tick lists of things that people would and wouldn't want didn't work very well even for people with those conditions because they didn't anticipate how complex both pe the changing care needs and people's lives were and their values changed over the period of it. So what looked like a very empowering framework turned out to be more inflexible. The legal designation of a legal proxy is a much more powerful uh, document and one of the ones that both people from the disability community with a knowledge of law and a lot of the provider side felt was very important because it designated a person who had uh, much more legal power to make decisions in those situations and they were, uh, in, and the person was legally empowering them by signing the document, designating them in a legal way. The other thing we tried to do was really a continuation of this work of trying to see what medical students and physicians in general learned about disability and particularly disability in ethical decision-making situations. Uh, and so issues like quality of life, the futility of a medical intervention might look very different from the perspective of an intensive care physician and a person who was brought into ICU and respiratory arrest but who had lived on a ventilator for 40 years. But we, on the, as part of this project, looked at what all medical students were taught about end-of-life ethics. We looked at the case studies they used. We looked at how disability was represented. And we had focus groups and, and interviews with individual tutors. And we also looked at teaching that was done by people with disability versus uh, the regular curriculum that are taught by people who are experts but not living with a disability themselves. And the kind of things that we found out was that doctors have a tremendous orientation to pragmatism, which is necessary, but teaching case studies that people with disabilities brought, that brought in the context of living and access, were infinitely powerful. The focus of the ethics theme on, on other communities that overlap with the concerns of the disability community in terms of access to palliative care uh, came out of the fact that some of the people that we interviewed uh, from the disability community were also from First Nations communities. Some of them were from other ethnocultural and faith communities where they were dealing with uh, a common issue of barriers to accessing palliative care. So um, if, if you were an Aboriginal elder from a northern community, you ran into structural barriers in terms of the availability of good pain control if you wanted to st stay in your own community and die in your own community. You ran into organizational barriers of gaps between federal and provincial coverage that probably made it quite difficult for you not to go to Winnipeg for your last days. And um, many of the people also talked about the context of history and spiritual values so that many elders who had come out of a residential school experience were very reluctant to spend their last days in an urban hospital. The memory of another institution, another time um, 
foreign lang languages that you don't understand were, were very powerful factors. The other thing, even though palliative care has broadened what spiritual care uh, encompasses well beyond um, the, the original notion of hospice coming out of a Christian tradition, uh, many of the people that we talked to in these other communities said it's got to be even more inclusive uh, in terms of our spiritual practitioners and the fact that dying at home may be dying on a reserve community. The challenge of the system is to provide the good technical pain control and social support in a community where those are very hard things to deliver. But it's the spiritual context that we want to live and die in. Where we really overlapped with the policy theme was to try to create a dialogue both within the team. So this statement, I think that Jim made, it took years for members of the research project to learn to speak and understand each other's language around these issues. This real gulf between the way care providers and people with disability often talk and think. Ethical safe space is really a concept that a friend and colleague, uh, Willie Ermine, who's a, an ethicist um, working in Saskatchewan, and it was really the notion that some in, in cross-cultural work or work between communities that don't share the same values, there's a desperate need to come together um, in a common ground and look at the areas where we agree, look at the areas where we disagree, but at least clarify our values in a situation where we won't be penalized so that we don't um, state a religious ideology that will disenfranchise us from the best care within that institution, which shouldn't happen under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But we ended up in uh, 2008 having a large meeting, and rather than have a meeting where we preach to the converted, we invited the whole spectrum of uh, policy and care providers in the disability community, and we knew that it was a forum where there would be debate and discussion, and we focused on issues related to the physician's final authority in making decisions. It was a hotly contested day, but the power of it was this notion of ethical safe space to come together in a place where we can exchange ideas, recognize our values may conflict around many of the central issues in ethics, but the need for that dialogue and to understand each other's perspective. I think one of the biggest contributions that the disability community has brought to it is their willingness to go into the medical community and experience, risk the dialogue, and providers like Harvey and many of the people from the palliative care community to come in and risk it from the other side. When there was a disagreement about life-sustaining or life-ending treatment, and the notion was um, that we wanted to create a, a common ground were really difficult ethical issues which probably weren't resolvable and which were being challenged in the legal system at the time and continue to be legally problematic were, could be talked about by people on both sides fairly in a mediated discussion. We could bring in experts from both sides, lawyers and ethicists and representatives from the disability organizations who in many cases had opposing kinds of perspectives. And at the end of the day, the, the idea of ethical safe space was that none of the people who talked about opposing perspectives uh, would be penalized and, and we'd have the benefit of the full range of perspectives out there. We were interested in looking at how people, uh, in particular people with disabilities, were, are seen by others and treated by others. If they're seen as having uh, worth, so they're valued, and hold valued social roles, or if they're actually devalued. And so uh, when we started out, we actually, it was social D in parentheses valuation. We we're looking at that, uh, the perceptions of people who were in palliative care and at end of life. It was, I think, striking for us how important some of these findings were, uh, thinking about the actual experiences of people at the end of their lives. We all have certain assumptions and perceptions about other people, and uh, those assumptions are then uh, what we use to guide our behavior, to guide our actions, consciously or not. 
And so what uh, we were interested in at the start of this project was uh, what were the assumptions people had, palliative care providers and other decision makers, for instance, had about people with disabilities and, uh, and how that translated into the availability of end-of-life care and uh, the supports that they would receive. So the first thing is that words are important and our language is important because our assumptions and beliefs uh, whether we're conscious of these assumptions or not, are carried in the words that we use. And uh, the language that we use um, also uh, then turns around and reinforces those beliefs. Because if we believe something and then we say it out loud, and then that helps to reinforce and perpetuate our beliefs. And uh, this can include uh, positive beliefs about other people and things, as well as uh, more negative beliefs and stereotypical kinds of beliefs. One of the first things we learned was that uh, many people with disabilities were seen, are seen, as actually being at the end of their lives when in fact they may not be. So that was one thing that, that struck us very early on. That had some pretty important implications because what it meant was that uh, people were then treated as if they were at the end of their, li at the end of their lives. And uh, instead of receiving care uh, to live or supports to live life, uh, they may have been denied care and support that would have helped them live. So it was a very important uh, finding that we had. Um, we also learned that, at least for some people with disabilities, they simply don't have access to palliative care when they are actually at the end of their lives. Um, that it, it literally isn't accessible for them. And, um, and uh, a third uh, or another perception about people is that um, because of the, the, the lack of social valuation that people with disabilities experience, that there was this belief that at least some people with disabilities were actually better off dead. The assumption was it would be better to be dead than to be alive with a disability. Our assumptions translate into some common behaviors and are in the big collective sense. So we found that there is certainly a sentiment, even a set of assumptions, that would suggest it is better to be dead than to be alive with a disability. Our study, we looked and analyzed some, uh, we, we looked a lot at language and how it's used to value or devalue people in certain situations. But in particular, towards the end of our work, we looked at three words that came up a lot uh, all across uh, the project and the, the studies we were doing, and the words include suffer, compassion, and vulnerability. But the other really important thing to remember about language is that it not only reinforces our beliefs, you know, based on our beliefs and reinforces our beliefs, but it, but it leads to action. And so we, humans, act out what we believe. And so our beliefs about uh, suffering, compassion, and vulnerability get acted out um, in our interactions with other people. And this, of course, includes the kinds of supports uh, and opportunities that are made available pe to people uh, with disabilities and other people throughout their lives and at the end of their lives. Disabled people for some time have challenged and rejected the words designated uh, to describe them. The words crippled, deaf and dumb, uh, spastic, uh, and so on, uh, retarded, idiot, cretin. I mean, going back in time, we find some pretty nasty words. I think we have a social consensus not to use many of these words anymore. But there are other words that are not so much the label applied to people as the descriptor used to describe people. And uh, we find that some of these words are common in the palliative care community. Palliative care providers quite understandably see themselves as understanding suffering, as working to alleviate suffering. And by that they often mean pain. Perhaps they mean anxiety or other kind of very unpleasant experiences. But they, I think, consider themselves by the work they do with dying people or people near end of life, 
to be experts in suffering. Again, understandably, they associate uh, their work with compassion. They strive to be compassionate in their work with people at end of life. And of course, I think you could see there's some pretty practical implications if you have care providers who are working with that kind of mindset, uh, even if they may not be entirely aware that that is, in fact, the belief system that they have and are working with. And, uh, you know, sometimes we see it in terms of who gets invited into a conversation about care and support. So sometimes a person with a disability might be excluded from at least part of the conversation um, and instead the conversation is with family members or other care providers. And sometimes uh, there are no questions at all. You know, the care providers might act uh, without checking with people. And so that has some very significant uh, implications for people. And so care practices might exclude marginalized individuals or groups of people. We realized there were a wide variety of words that we could look at. But we wanted to do the research in depth, historically, and in the popular usage of the words, current usage of the words. So we, de we knew we needed to narrow, narrow down the list. Uh, we, I guess, talked to a number of people and decided that uh, suffering, for example, is such a common word associated with disability and end of life and vulnerability was often cited as a devaluing term that would, uh, in a sense, reduce the quality of life for people. And uh, compassion, strangely enough, which on the surface would seem to be a very positive word, was often used wrongly to, to mean pity or to mean uh, a kind of sympathy that belittles or does not uh, recognize uh, the full personhood, the full respect that uh, people deserve. And so that word itself was also chosen. Also compassion was a word often associated with arguments for euthanasia and uh, assisted suicide. So those kinds of end-of-life scenarios were somewhat supported by, in my view, the misuse of the word compassion. And uh, I think as we interviewed people with disabilities, we found there was uh, a real concern about the use of the word compassion, especially in terms of end-of-life for people with disabilities because of the way people with disabilities were devalued by other words as well. I think the word suffering is an interesting word to consider because uh, for at least, the word is a complex word and has many different meanings, but it has come to be equated with living with a disability, that if one lives with a disability, one is automatically assumed to be suffering, and usually suffering from the disabling condition. For instance, the person suffers from cerebral palsy or um, ALS or whatever the condition might be. And, and then there is uh, one common response to that, um, especially where you have the uh, perception that disability is, is worse than death, that death is better than living with a disability, is that in order to alleviate suffering, you know, you have to respond. And if the suffering is in fact the disabling condition, the way to alleviate suffering in the person is to end that person's life. And that's a very different response uh, from other, another meaning of suffering, which is to actually, uh, the person is to provide comfort and to provide care and to make the person's life uh, more comfortable. Um, but in, at least for some people with disabilities, in particular significant and severe disabilities, you know, defined in that way, uh, the, the alleviation of suffering is equated with killing them. So the challenge is to uh, look for ways to take back the negative and limiting language that is used and to replace it 
with language that points to uh, possibility, to opportunity, to life. And uh, just as an example of this, we have an extensive quote here from Sam Filer, let me assure you, I am not confined to a wheelchair. I am mobilized by one. I am not ventilator dependent. I am a happy consumer of a lung expanding, breath giving device, which allows me to continue doing the things I love. It has given me, and thus, a degree of independence. It's a very different picture than one might assume from seeing um, a man uh, who has, who's living with ALS. Um, and then finally, the doctors told me that ALS is a virtual death sentence, but I am not dying from a life-threatening disease. I am living with a life-enhancing condition. So use that as a very powerful example of reclaiming language and taking back some of the beliefs and assumptions that other people might hold about us or about one. Um, and so really the, the big idea from this theme was understanding the power of language and then taking that into account. The traditional bias against disability, which occurs in every culture on this planet, uh, is not necessarily the reality that we experience as disabled people. Some of us, and more could, see our lives as challenging, as providing us a kind of richer experience on this planet, because it is difficult, different, and it is difficult sometimes, and it calls on us to have more imagination, to have more uh, inner strength to see the value of our lives or to experience our our lives uh, so fully, uh, perhaps more fully than someone who has a very easy life. That sounds like a rationalization, but I put it to you that it may be the underlying reality that in fact our lives may be richer and have more potential than some other easier lives. Uh, this flies in the face of common sense and convention. And uh, I don't think that I can uh, objectively show that this is the case. But subjectively, I can achieve, I can explore that possibility. And I can reach some level of understanding and perhaps even certainty that our lives are blessed or can be blessed by the experience of disability. Not an easy sell, though. We came into exploring dignity uh, because in, in the course of doing our research, we found that in jurisdictions where euthanasia and assisted suicide uh, takes place, um, according to researchers, dignity is oftentimes cited as the most prevalent reason why patients may have sought out the assistance of a, of a physician in, uh, in ending their life. Yet when we began to look at the literature, we found that there really were no studies that examined from the perspective of patients who are near the end of life what dignity was about. So dignity was a term that was very much cited in the literature in a variety of ways, a variety of definitions, highly politicized and used to support whatever position somebody might happen to take in end-of-life care, even a contentious position. But what was lacking was an empirical lens. Anybody who had looked at asking patients near end-of-life, what does dignity mean and how can it be achieved? We began doing studies to understand what dignity was about and we've spent the last decade finding out what dying patients mean by the issue of dignity, what experience can undermine or can support it. We've looked at uh, developing ways of measuring it. We've looked at psychological interventions that might actually address it and help preserve it. So dignity conserving care really refers to a way of approaching patients um, that is empirically informed, informed by research that we've done, that can tell healthcare providers how they might indeed accomplish the task of delivering end-of-life care that will be mindful of preserving the dignity of patients who are coming to the end of their days.
One of the key findings in, uh, in, in one of the studies on, on dignity was uh, that the most ardent predictor of dignity being preserved was whether or not somebody felt themselves to be perceived as valuable, as worthy of respect or esteem. That was a particularly heady and important finding because it said to us that um, everyone uh, needs to be valued. Everyone needs affirmation. But when you're ill, when you are particularly vulnerable, if you will, um, your sensitivities to things that might affront your sense of dignity are profound. I think the way that uh, the dignity and care approach can change palliative care uh, for persons with disabilities um, is very much the same way that it can change the care of all people. Um, the dignity in care approach says that the disposition, the outlook, the attitude, if you will, of the healthcare provider towards the patient and family is one of the strongest mediators of whether or not that experience is going to go well or not go well. Um, I think of it as being um, a, a responsibility that we can um, that we can make healthcare providers aware of, uh, the responsibility of providing dignity and care. But along with uh, responsibility as well goes a certain amount of um, empowerment. Um, what dignity and care should be saying to healthcare providers is um, you can shape this experience in a profound way. And when I say you, I mean anyone who has contact with patients or families. Um, this applies to the person who answers the phone at the reception desk. This applies to the person who cleans the room, delivers the tray of food to the room, or the person who's making the initial surgical incision. Um, across the board, the message is you are in a position to influence how people experience care. One of the tools that came out of this work is something that, uh, that we've called the ABCDs of Dignity Conserving Care. Um, this is a, a very simplified and simplistic mantra. Um, a is for attitude, B is for behavior, C for compassion, D for dialogue. Um, and although it's simplistic, um, the truth is that uh, those of us, like myself, who are in medicine, like simplicity. We like things that are formulaic. We like things that are easy to remember. Um, it gives us a tool to guide us in bedside care. So very briefly, what are the ABCDs of Dignity Conserving Care? And, and by the way, um, this sort of borrows on the, uh, the ABCDs of, of critical care. But the ABCDs of Dignity Conserving Care tries to provide a health care provider a very practical tool uh, because, as we were saying, I mean, many of these things seem very complex and heady. How do you come up with a message that is easily translated for somebody who is doing bedside care. And so what we've said is, A is for attitude. Your attitude has a profound influence on how that per patient perceives themselves to be looked after, whether they feel that they are being affirmed or disaffirmed, whether or not they feel that they are being defined by patienthood, or whether they feel that personhood, who they are as an individual, is somehow being acknowledged. So A for attitude. Um, at one point, uh, I think I've, I've said to groups of, uh, of healthcare providers, what happens between your ears has profound importance. You know, it's not just about what you do with patients. It's not just about what you do with patients and their families. It's what you think which again is quite heady, but if you reduce it down to something that is relatively uh, routinized and simple, at least it provides a tool for healthcare providers to be able to enact uh, in their care. So A is for attitude, B is for behavior. If your attitude begins to acknowledge personhood, what are the things that you can do in terms of your behavior that will affirm personhood of people who may be requiring care? And these don't have to be complicated. Uh, the fact that you might be distracted by your pager or you're checking your messages on your BlackBerry, 
mean, these things happen all of the time. And, uh, you know, when you're feeling well, most of us have the resilience to say, whatever. You know, we kind of brush it off. When you are feeling unwell, when you are feeling vulnerable, um, and I, I use that word very carefully, then you are much more likely to feel extremely sensitive to the fact that the person who's supposed to be providing you care seems to be distracted. You seem to be a patient, and um, no one wants to be a patient. It's one of the great ironies, I think, of being a healthcare provider. We train all of our lives to look after patients, and what we find out at the end of the day is nobody, nobody wants to be a patient, right? Or at least they don't want to be seen exclusively as just being that lump or just being, you know, that weird blood result that needs to be attended to. We could spend a long time talking about the C of ABCDs of Dignity Conserving Care, which is compassion. Um, and the definition of compassion is to be sensitive to the suffering of another and to want to respond to it. Well, I think if nothing else, what you've heard in our presentation today is we make assumptions about the life experience of another, including the suffering of another. So compassion and being compassionate doesn't necessarily buy you a ticket to providing great care because you might have it wrong. Your perceptions of another person's suffering may be completely misinformed. So we need to understand the lived experience of another person by asking them, by understanding that we can't know what it's like to live inside of someone's shoes or inside of someone's wheelchair or whatever we might substitute that for. Um, I also think, by the way, that uh, a key to understanding compassion is understanding um, our own vulnerability. And this gets back to the introductory remarks that, uh, that Deborah was making. Uh, the insight is that all of us are vulnerable. And D for dialogue, again, we could have a, a long conversation about this, but I think the, the critical uh, issue here is that conversations include some acknowledgement that the people we deal with are indeed people. Again, no one wants to be seen and defined exclusively as a patient or in terms of whatever it is that has brought them to the attention of healthcare providers. So, if we're going to then be mindful in the way that we are attentive to the needs of people who are nearing end of life, and I would say that this cuts even more broadly across the entire spectrum of uh, the human life cycle in providing care, period, not just end of life care, is, is there something about me and the way I think and my own attitudes and my own biases that may be shaping the way this experience is unfolding? One of the um, important and I think painful dynamics that um, I became aware of during the course of this study is that persons with disabilities, um, through the course of their life and various encounters with healthcare providers, um, have encountered situations where they have felt a sense of uh, distrust towards the care provider, um, sometimes based on uh, perhaps a series of experiences where they might have felt some degree of being devalued. Um, I think most people who come into healthcare come into healthcare because they have a good heart um, and they are driven by uh, the wish to do the right thing. Um, but that doesn't preclude the fact that they have um, an outlook and perhaps even biases they may not be conscious of that begin to shape the way uh, they approach individuals. So do our assumptions about other people start to shape what we might even think of as our very empathic and compassionate responses? So I think the, the way that vulnerability and dignity figure into all of this is that persons with disabilities come to health care with those prior experiences and perhaps with that degree of baggage. If we're not mindful of that, it's very easy, unwittingly, for us to get this wrong. I suppose the, uh, the larger um, lesson, and maybe the, uh, the epiphany, if you will, is that that sensitivity shouldn't only have application to persons with disabilities. Um, if we can come to our practice in a mindful way, um, 
what we end up doing is being responsive to people um, across the broad spectrum of uh, human experience, wherein vulnerability is recognized to be part of a human condition. So the insights about vulnerability, dignity, and affirmation apply not only to people with disabilities, who themselves may come to this with a particular sensitivity, but all persons who are human and vulnerable um, to feeling vulnerable. There's an old saying, life is with people. And uh, this project has been largely about learning that life is with people. Life is not simply being an amputee or being blind or having an intellectual impairment. It has to do with how we relate to other people around us and even more how they relate to us, what our social experience is. If our society constructs itself to marginalize and exclude us, that can be an, an experience that creates real poverty, not so much in a financial sense, although that is true as well, but in the sense of being with people, having the rich social life that uh, we all need to greater or lesser degrees. This project has been about understanding not the objective, quantifiable, measurable, physical aspects of our lives, but rather about the outcome of the way we relate and others relate to us, and the importance of those relationships in regard to the quality of our lives and of the end of our life experience.